Welcome um, to our little lunchtime book discussion. Um, I don't want to belittle at all. It's just that we sort of are wanting this to keep this between formal a bit in terms of that we are actually talking about very specific topics and, and, and super interesting things, but informal enough so that we can encourage discussion, including from you audience attendees as well. And, and of course, already we had a pre event discussion with Annabella and Lev about what is a lunchtime event anyway, and especially also lunch, lunchtime depends where you are. So we are today synchronizing our clocks according to time in Prague, um, perhaps a late lunch if 1 p.m. is late lunch as it is in Prague now. Uh, as our event is hosted by the Operational Images and Visual Cultures project that is located at the Academy of Performing Arts, in Prague, a project that is, is funded by Czech Science uh, Foundation. Um, as it says at the bottom of the screen, my name is Jussi Parikka, and I'm the director um, of the mentioned project, as well as one of the two editors of Photography of the Scale that is published by Edinburgh University Press. Uh, unfortunately, Thomas uh, Dvozak is unable to join us today. But luckily we have anyway, as we were planning, Dr. Annabella Pollen from University of Brighton with us, um, who is a contributor um, to the book and today joining us in the discussion. And as importantly, we are today discussing uh, also Lev Manovich's Cultural Analytics, a book that came out with, from MIT Press um, recently and which discusses Lev's, I think it's 14 years of dealing with the question of cultural analytics as a method and its impact on visual culture research, um, and not just perhaps visual culture research, but we'll hear about that more soon, um, including this crucial link to uh, questions of data, um, again, methodologically, theoretically, and in multiple other ways as well. I will hand over and introduce our speakers uh, soon in slightly more detail, but just briefly, I'm gonna recap and introduce why we are here. In other words, what is our theme? I am not going to use slides. I just posted the links to the books. So for instance, you might want to have a look now if you don't want to look at my face, um, you can check out um, the URLs. Um, but about the books briefly, the books that came out almost at the same time, and we're grateful to have Lev's um, endorsement at the back of our book, Photography of the Scale. The books come from slightly different directions, but they do share a lot of concerns about scale, about collections, about measure, and about quantity in visual culture in different ways, about the multiple instead of merely the singular, as if those two would be necessarily opposite either. Um, photography of the scale, as the title reveals, um, and the host department of the project, um, Department of Photography, emerges from discussions in photography scholarship, which, however, are quite radically also transformed um, in context of data and network culture, as we know. This includes both how we view um, or even access um, histories of photography as well, how we theorize these images, um, and also what are the practices that pertain to photographic images in and out of platforms, platforms of aggregation and cultural practices that relate to these mass scale data sets, right? Um, cultural analytics departs already from the middle of data culture as a project and as a book, especially large data sets, big data, and the question of what form of methods adequately speaks to this quantity of available data that itself should not merely reproduce the terms of cultural analysis that we inherited across decades, across hundreds of years, but revise them accordingly. And you can see all of the interface here. These two books, these two projects, they meet somewhere in the middle in that transformation of data and images and what techniques start to define both. Also problematizing what is exactly visible when we deal with visual culture. Thus, um, both explicitly um, and implicitly deal with, for instance, questions of scale um, as an issue of theory and method of perspective and, and, and an insight, insight in which ways that is not only about bigger or smaller, less or more, um, but a shift in research of visuality 
what it means to that, and 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 basically what what are the units of analysis um, again uh, for our work. Similarly, a lot has happened in the scholarship of photography and visual culture, including that different kinds of images enter the scene of analysis. Here, I want to refer, or actually, to Lev's book. Uh, because Lev talks about this um, and refers to this period between 1800 and 1850s as the emergence of modern statistical graphics. As part of this, what I would call a lineage of these other images, other than photographic images, which however later come to define what is visualization, what are photographic images. So 1800s and that period of statistical graphics returns via these questions of data. So bar and pie charts, histograms, line graphs, time series plots, contour plots, you name it. In other words, all sorts of diagrams and other become an interface to data, data sets, and what later then indeed becomes the crucial question of data visualization, right? Um, photography of the scale and its various wonderful contributions deals with change of images in context of current practices and platforms, as well as AI techniques. For instance, Joanna Zielinska shows this well in her chapter. Um, photography features as a constant reference point, despite what I just said, that it's also transformed. Um, Michelle Henning's work, Joanna von Schuperta, Jeffrey Batchen's work in their dialogue, they're firmly rooted in photographic practice, photographic arts even. But we also stretched this discussion um, to what Sean Cubitt coins as the Mars image a concept that also features um, in the subtitle of the book as well. So in Qubit's words, um, and the term, the term concerns the aggregation of images and their metadata in vast corporate data, um, data banks, data sets of Google, Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, and you name it, right? This is a political ecological question according to Qubit, and it relates to both aesthetics and economy. In other words, to seeing and to ownership. As Qubit puts it in his chapters, um, Coda, I quote, labor in the Mars image is everywhere freely given and everywhere in chains and echoing um, famous words from 19th century of different sorts. Deep into the political ecology and economy of images, the scale of what is invisible in the mass image becomes surfaced in many instances of these chapters. We can return to some of these topics in the discussion, and I believe that we might have in the attendees as well, some of our contributors who I warmly encourage also to join us in the discussion um, after, after our contributions, I mean the talks now. Um, a lot of the work in the book goes into the question of scale as it's qualified across existing cultural theoretical questions of representation, gender, embodiment in and beyond the human scale, while at the same time teasing out these useful approaches and methodologies that try to understand the other scale of images as well. Uh, for instance, on planetary level or as non-representational images that work with practices of light in a slightly different key. Again, for, think of LIDAR, for instance, in this case. Um, but importantly, and I want to emphasize this also when I'm gradually going to start soon introducing our speakers, the book doesn't want to merely put all the focus and stakes into digital images and instead looks at the core questions across the analog digital divide uh, without assuming that it's a rigid one always. Hence today's guest, Annabel Poland, were, Annabel Poland's work is an outstanding example of how, how to deal with questions of practice of collections, um, of slide libraries, and in such ways that remind of the various institutions in which images in the very much plural are hosted and cared for and become infrastructure for analysis. And this idea of infrastructure is I think quite very much present in Lev's work as well, but we can discuss this more later. So in terms of photography of the scale, and I focus a tiny bit more on this now, but because we'll get to cultural analytics as well. Uh, photography of the scale, the introduction offers a more detailed discussion as to what we mean by the variety of themes of measure and scale and quantity. Um, in the context of the event now, um, I want to hand it over to our speakers and briefly introduce them both with a quick biographical note, after which um, I'll hand it over to them. But I'll, I'll, I'll just sketch out our introductions to our speakers as well, and then I'll shut up. Um, so Annabelle Poland is reader in the history of art and design at the University of Brighton in the UK as well. 
Her research interests include histories of popular image, uh, popular image cultures, especially in relation to mass photographic uh, practices. So Neva's work has dealt with all of these questions extensively already before. She has published on photographic abundance in the books, Mass Photography, Collective Histories of Everyday Life, uh, and, and, and also in Photography to Reframed, re um, New Visions in Contemporary Photographic Culture, uh, which was co-edited with Ben Burbridge. Uh, and and multiple multiple other essays as well. Um, she's also working on many other themes as well. And I'm sort of a, like keeping it their introduction short. And and but I sort of, sort of a, um, please Google um, Annabelle's um, 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 University of Brighton page for all the kind of wonderful work that she's been doing as well. Uh, before I hand it over to Annabelle, I already now want to introduce Lev, who many would say, and I would say as well, doesn't need introductions, but I still do. Um, Similarly, as Annabelle has been dealing extensively with questions of mass photographic practice, Lev has been dealing extensively as well um, in terms of digital culture, software culture, cultural analytics, um, data sciences in relation to humanistic study and, and more. Um, Lev is an author and editor of multiple books, including the very recent one that we are discussing today, Cultural Analytics, that came out with MIT Press, but also AI Aesthetics, that came out 2019, um, Software Takes Command in 2013, and of course, Language of New Media, 2001. So it's 20 years, it's, um, it's a celebration year for that as well. Um, Lev is a presidential professor at the Graduate Center at City University of New York and indeed a director of the Cultural Analytics Lab and the various projects that have been featured in multiple cultural institutions. Um, I'm going to hand it over first to Annabelle. Um, after Annabelle's um, 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 talk, we'll go directly to Lev and after which we'll just open up to discussion. We have um, for the whole event, I've spent about 15 minutes, but we'll, for the whole event we have 90 minutes and I warmly welcome everyone and especially our speakers. Annabelle, over to you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm just going to share my screen. Give me a shout when you can see my slides. Yes, it Any works. Good? Yeah, it works. Great. We've got um, your slides up there. Great. So thank you very much for having me and thanks for that very nice introduction, um, you see. I'm really pleased to be a part of this book, which I think is a really important study and um, it does lots of things that I am not capable of doing. So I'm really enjoying being part of a dialogue with some very impressive and eminent colleagues. Um, to talk about the image on mass and the mass image. So um, just to kind of introduce myself and my work then briefly, um, for my chapter for um, Photography Off the Scale, I picked up on some themes that I've been exploring in relation to mass photography as a form and also to archives and collections of um, photographs on mass. So two slightly different things, I think. So I've been thinking for some time about the public desires and anxieties about photographic multitudes and photographic excess, where, according to some, we're standing on the precipice of a kind of dizzying image abyss. So um, for my talk for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, I'm going to outline some of the content of my chapter, and that's the chapter title. And um, I consider in that chapter the photographic abyss through an examination of the visual device of mise on a beam and also WJT Mitchell's concept of the meta picture, that is self-referential images that might be capable of reflection on themselves, capable of providing, he says, a second order discourse that tells us, or at least shows us something about pictures. And for my presentation, I'm gonna pull out one particular section from the chapter and that is the work of contemporary artists who explore photographic enormity as their subject matter. So um, as recent surveys have observed, and here's just a couple, there is a tendency for contemporary artists to work with photographic abundance as both medium and message. So for example, Robert Shaw's post photography, the artist with a camera, he observed in that book the tendency for 
for photographers to quote, conclude that the world out there is so hyper documented, there's no point in taking your own pictures anymore. And he identified what he described as a leading post photographic strategy among artists who glean from the abundant resources, for example, in the online environments, in the guise of curator and editor. And then John Fonkuberta, also one of the contributors to the book, um, for example, in his 2015 exhibition and publication, among many other works, um, but specifically here in the post photographic condition, similarly noted what he called a post photographic readiness among artists to make use of the overwhelming quantities of scale made available by the expansion in photographic practice. A recent strand of this artistic practice has utilized the 35 mil slides deaccessions from institutional art history collections over the last 10 years with the coming of new commercial digital image collections and new digital display mechanisms. As a result of collections management exercises, these materials, these slides, 35 mil pedagogic slides, have come to be considered outmoded. I'm showing you here an example from my own um, institution's dismantled slide library. Perhaps more of that story later if you want to hear it. Um, so a 2014 survey of 112 art history slide collections across Britain and North America, for example, revealed that more than 75% were no longer intact. The vast majority were undergoing culling, had been disseminated or had been put into storage. Slide collections in that survey typically ranged in size from 80,000 slides to 550,000 slides, showing the scale of the problem that needed to be dealt with. Indeed, slide libraries quantities were always a key aspect of their form. Photographic historian Constanza Carafa has argued that the accumulation of photographs has long characterised the discipline of art history. She quotes art historian Bernard Berenson on this point from the 1930s, a quote, photographs, photographs, in our work one can never have enough. And similarly, art historian Urban Panofsky is said to have claimed that he who has the most photographs wins. So after these enormities have been accumulated, but the institutions and their users no longer want them, where should they go? And the answer has been in many cases to artists. So nearly half of the institutions surveyed in 2014 had donated them in that direction. So to link the accession slide collections to debates about photographic scale, I'm going to quickly outline three examples of that contemporary artistic practice, each of which I argue demonstrates a metapictorial art form. And the first I'm showing you here is in the work of German artist Philip Goldbach, who used the 200,000 deaccession slides from the Institute of Art History Cologne. In his 2013 installation Sturm or Iconoclasm, the entire collection was displayed as if unceremoniously dumped on the floor of a whole gallery in Wiesbaden Museum. Taken at face value, Sturm suggests the fallen leaves of slides shaken from the tree of their institution after a period perhaps of dramatic turbulence and iconoclasm seems to refer to their radical removal from storage and classification systems. Shaken down in this way they become a kind of floor based sculpture borrowing from the aesthetics of minimalism but utilising a form of maximalism in their overwhelming spread. And photographic historian Stefan Siegel has noted that Goldbach's Sturm display encapsulates both the big picture of its overall effect and another perspective. The installation is made up of lots of pictures, of little pictures, which are countless pictures of other pictures. As a second example, in Canada, photographer Susan Dobson has been working with similar material in the photographic series Slide Library. Dobson's photographs are of projection apparatus as well as slides themselves and enable views of an imaging system as well as its results. In her slide trays installation at the Santa Cruz Library in Tenerife, Spain in 2017, she created a 12 by 50 foot mural of side on slides organized by geographic subject matter 
again using scaling up as a means to draw attention to a material now considered obsolete, as well as well as to its emphases and its lacunae. And scale is again key to the work's meaning, as Alison Nordstrom has put it of Dobson's work as innumerable small fragments of knowledge, almost overwhelming in their quantity and uniformity, it is in their number that slights matter. And Dobson plays the scale in her final prints where proportions are inverted, the architectural scale of slide drawers and slide carousels tower over, tower over the viewer in acts of estrangement. And in the final example, again, another Canadian artist, um, this time Annie MacDonald, who describes her work as questioning the constitution, function and circulation of images in the 21st century. And the artist uses, again, deaccession de slides, in her case, found next to the trash, uh, as she called it, at a higher education institution who, interestingly, asked not to be identified. Each slide image had been produced on a copy stand variously from art monograph or fashion magazine or te technical manual sources. And MacDonald highlighted the multiple transformations that the images are taken in their journey from say paintings on walls and reproductions in print to copying as slides and to then viewing as a digital artwork in the final form. Um, showing edges and folds, reflections and loss of focus, and sometimes fingers in the frame from the slide librarians. The seeming errors in the slide reproductions, self-consciously betraying their status as copies, also reveal their multiply reproduced genealogies. So if scale is inherent to all photographic thinking, it also by extension becomes the subject matter for metapictorial photography about photography and art about art history. And scale, as Yussi said um, with Thomas in the introduction to the book, scale in photography is not just about the too large or the excessive. Um, it's about the push-pull contrast of the individual image potentially full of uh, detail and powerful in meaning in juxtaposition with its enormous quantities. And as such, art from slide collections moves from that micro to macro view in microscoping to telescoping oscillation, from piles, stacks, grids, and multiple filing cabinets to single views of tiny details writ large. And the large and the small become the warp and the weft of meaning. The individual element in the mass becomes a pictorial device to understand the meaning of the whole. And so in my chapter, I draw on W.J.T. Mitchell's conceptualization of meta pictures as any picture that's used to reflect on the nature of pictures. He reflects a quote, the meta picture is not a subgenre within the fine arts, but a fundamental potentiality inherent in pictorial representation as such. It's the place where pictures reveal and know themselves and where they reflect on the intersections of visuality, language and similitude, where they engage in speculation and theorising on their own nature and history." End quote. So this idea of an image within an image or a story within a story was first encapsulated as a narrative device by novelist André Gide in 1893. He stated in a work of art, I rather like to find transposed on the scale of the characters the very subject of that work. Nothing he said throws a clearer light upon it or more surely establishes the proportions of the whole. And again, here proportion is the telling term. The scaling up and down shows the innermost center and the outside parameters. In heraldic terms, the abeam of mise en abeam, that picture within a picture, um, evokes abyss, depth, infinity, vertigo and falling, according to this um, excellent book, The Mirror in the Text, which studies mise en abeam by Dallenbach. But photographically, the mise en abeam has been read, for example, by Craig Owens in relation to photography's own condition as a mirror form and as a site of potentially endless reproduction. So in dialogue with these conceptualizations, then in my chapter, I argue that the mise en abeam as a metapic pictorial device might illuminate aspects of photographic excess as seen in the artistic methods of hundreds upon thousands of slides tumbled across gallery floors, piled up by dustbins, or scaled up into mon monumental photographic portrayals. 
As photographic means for telling photographic stories, slides were always metapictorial, but their status intensifies as they stand outside immediate utility and take on symbolic form. As Jeffrey Batchen, another one of the um, contributors to Lebel, the book, can I just, and I think here, hi. Um, yeah. Can you just press hide? with the so that the the, the little yes. tab at the end sure. yeah, the hide button yes uh, exactly oh, so you haven't been able to see yeah, every, my everybody wants to see everybody labels. wants to no oh. no worries that's perfect <laughs> sorry this oh, is good. my last slide so oh. um you can see the last caption but none of the others sorry hopefully um there's a way of getting that information to you if you want it i can put it in the chat if you're missing specific credits sorry so um Yes, when slides become um, symbolic and stand outside their immediate utility, they take on an extra metapictorial dimension. So I'm going to quote from Jeffrey Batchin, one of the um, audience members here and one of the contributors to the book, who's observed, he has observed of snapshots, quote, the advent of digital technologies means that this kind of photography is now taken on an extra memorial role, not only of the subject it depicts, but of its own operation as a system of representation. And I think, um, although I'm not going to discuss this example in any detail, this um, particular slide from the University of Brighton's um, demolished slide library, I think encapsulates some of that rather poetically. So the photographic abyss in conclusion, plays out in artistic reinterpretations of slide collections. It's materialised in slides vast scale where they communicate their own unwieldiness, the scale of the problem of how to dispose of them and the scale of the new media that replaces them. It's also seen in photography's endless reproducibility and endless copies as an inherently mirrored multiple media form. And it's seen in the images, the individual images, excesses, as tiny fragments of abundant potential always implicated in interrelations of scale of order and disorder. So as pictures about pictures, the micro view of individual slides and the macro view of artworks made of them speak of parts and wholes of failure and promise and of the desires and anxieties about photographic multiples and masses. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Um, that was an excellent insight um, to, to uh, your chapter and, and, and many of the other themes as well. And, and besides the pictures within pictures, it's also uh, questions of metadata, clearly part of this as already in multiple ways. And, and um, I'm going to hand it over to Lev, but also I just want to point out that the phrase of who has the most pictures wins, um, most photographs wins. Um, I think Lev talks about um, questions of how to deal with uh, billion images, was it? Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of a, like a bar there already. Um, Lev, over to you. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for organizing this event. You know, there are so many discussions today about you know, photography, AI, art, etc., you know, Bitcoin, and it's nice to have you know, to focus on something. So I think the Annabella's uh, talk brilliantly demonstrates one of the uh, key, most interesting things, as I see them, from uh, being engaged with computational photography, computer vision, machine learning, and so on, that the new dimensions of visual culture, such as scale, are not only obviously relevant for understanding our photographic present, but they also become relevant as a way to rethink our photographic past. And uh, obviously, the scale of photography was always there, right? Uh, you know, there's a number of times when like, new photographic technology led to a sudden explosion and the increase in the scale of images, the scale of access. Right. Your press for button with the rest was the famous advertising of Kodak for its first easy to use camera in the 1880s. Uh, you know, and we kind of paid attention to it, but I think only in the last decade, right, this new scale of digital visual culture makes this dimension more visible. So I'm going to uh, uh, start my 13 minutes, the clock is clicking, by doing something which uh, people haven't done before, which is actually to show you how his books look, because we do have nice physicality, and uh, I'm lucky to have both of them. Of course, I have my own, but this is photography of a scale, uh, and as you can see, it has color images, 
including all the captions you couldn't see. Um, so very nice, more compact. Even mine is a kind of hardcover, right? More institutional looking cultural analytics uh, from MIT Press uh, with uh, old fashioned looking color insert. You know, this is what you get when you work with this kind of presses. Uh, but luckily I have, you know, thousands of images online, solely images of the projects on Flickr in our website. So this is how these two things look. Uh, now I will share the screen, I hope, yes, perfect. And I want to uh, do a couple of things. Uh, first, I want to show you the table of contents of my book and kind of explain to you the logic behind how it's put together. And then maybe just if I have time, highlight what was my motivating point uh, because my work is always comes from my practice of an artist, designer, you know, video editor and so on. I only write about things which I do myself and also my practice for now over 20 years as a teacher of these things. Uh, so inspirations of my book comes from things I use every day, whether it is Zoom, TikTok, or Photoshop. But first table of content, okay, table of content, choose this, right. Um, so uh, let's see. Well, I noticed that um, you know, if you make a Twitter post and uh, you know, people really like to uh, reshare and uh, you know, pay attention to various lists. So I said, okay, I should also give my readers the list. So in the introduction, you'll find five key ideas of cultural analytics. Uh, and, and here I should say with cultural analytics, it's a growing field, there is an international journal, there has been a few conferences, there is at least a dozen of, um, university programs. And of course, everybody understands it differently, very strategically, which is completely fine. So my job is not to police the field, but my job is to offer you what I think are both like fundamental concepts and what I see is many, many interesting research directions which have been taking it. So these five ideas and introduction is kind of my take on what for me are five key ideas in my own cultural analytic journey, which started uh, in the fall of 2015. And then I also outline 12 research challenges. The first part of the book, Studying Culture at Scale, uh, establishes the argument, uh, which is maybe today is more obvious than it was <laughs> in 2016 when I was putting the book together, but it may be not obvious to everybody that uh, because of a number of reasons, which mostly have to do with technology, uh, because digital media and the internet uh, have made it uh, kind of uh, very easy right, to become a cultural producer. And today, right, you get a phone, you're automatically enrolled into this tribe of people called photographers, right? So we have one billion photographers. So we have this explosion of both amateur and professional uh, culture, including visual culture, uh, approximately in the middle of 2000s. And how do we look at this? Right? To put this differently, you know, uh, in the 20th century, the number of cultural artifacts which were produced and the number of cultural artifacts people thought to work with analysis was quite small. And that's why I think film theory and photographic theory, you know, semiotics, such history, literary theory developed such forms as you know, close readings or Roland Bart can write an article where he can analyze a single image. Uh, and that was very appropriate. Today we are faced with a, a different situation we have all our wonderful theories, which people developed in the 20th century. We don't know how to look at the subjects of our study, right? So if people only on Instagram share something like 100 million photos per day, none of us has any idea what's out there. And I can tell you it's not selfies, it's not Kim Kardashian's, it's thousands of photographic cultures. It's all kind of content. It's not banal, it's not unique, it's everything. And it's impossible to see. So to me, you know, I realized this uh, around 2005, and I said, if I'm to continue to be writing about contemporary visual culture, both digital and analog, uh, perhaps I need to look at computer tools uh, as a possible mechanism uh, to be able to look at my subjects of study. And the tools which I had in mind were both computer vision, the field which was developed in development since late 50s, right, use of algorithms to teach computers how to see, uh, built into you know, all the imaging software, you know, Photoshop, your camera and so on. Uh, machine learning, which was not so popular yet, but also data visualization is a way to uh, make visible 
relationship between potential lots of images. Uh, so I kind of set this context, including reproducing with, with my first article, where I can register uh, my excitement about these possibilities, and also I put this a bit in a critical perspective. So then my next chapter, chapter two, asks, okay, so if we hypothetically to ask, now to have so much culture, like atoms and universe, so to speak, we can perhaps think of a kind of science of culture, but what does it mean? Right? So we have three models of science, the classical science, Alain Newton, where we develop certain kind of laws which can in fact predict right future. So that's one model of science. Another is a statistical model, probably probabilistic model. And in fact, you know, all of the millions of papers published about contemporary photography, which are published by computer scientists and people in computation social science who study social media, do use statistical approach. And the third one would be simulation. So perhaps you know we can take uh, a body of photographs you know, from you know, 1870s to try to simulate development of photographic language and photographic imagery in the 1890s. And then as a way to test if our model will be correct. Then I talk about uh, the relation between kind of cultural analytics and the uh, culture industry. The fact that uh, in the previous decade, right, in, 2000, in 2010s, the whole culture industry right, has moved to using the same cultural analytics methods so I think about search engines, recommendation engines, Google image search, uh, the way, let's say Instagram uh, right, may analyze, you know, all the, all the photographs and all the activity on its site and offer you certain photographs which you may be interested in. And of course, uh, the computation, which is also built into every single camera uh, in your phone. Uh, by the time, for example, if you use Google Pixel, by the time your, your image is being saved on the, uh, in, the, in the computer memory, it's worked on by 34 algorithms, will be explained. Um, so then uh, the second part of the book is really the center, because what I came to realize through teaching and uh, doing dozens of uh, practical projects myself with people in my lab, is that once you represent culture as data, you know, as variables, as numbers, as databases, as networks, the rest is not so different from normal methods of using data science. I mean, you can use cluster analysis, dimensional reduction, classification, uh, fit curves, and so on. So what is, I think, separates cultural analytics, as I see it, from the rest of analytics, is that how do you take this elusive right, and mysterious thing we call culture and represent it as data? So if I want to represent development of photography and try to apply computational methods to it, what do I do? I mean, do I scan photographs? Or do I scan articles of photographic journals? Do I look at the articles in popular press about photography? Uh, do I scan all these negatives? Uh, how do I how do I know what I represent? Not only uh, what I, I not only recreate the canon of photographic history, but I include the known. And um, you know, and here I think computational methods, in fact, make fully visible how biased and how incomplete our cultural histories are, right? I mean, there's millions of books about art photography, and there's only a handful book about vernacular photography. And, uh, and that's why I kind of wrote my own book about Instagram as a photographic culture in 2017, and it's still the only book, right? Uh, because for a strange reason, uh, lots of people who deal with photography and those visual arts are not interested in what normal people do, they're only interested in what artists do. And artists do interesting things, but they're most interested in what the rest of 8 billion people do. Um, so I talk about types of cultural data, but it represents something in terms of artifacts, in terms of behaviors, for example, going to exhibition, you know, looking at things, talking to people, or clicking on things, you know, liking things, in terms of interactions, right? And then uh, I already mentioned this idea of cultural sampling. I think with humanities have to develop your own sampling theory. So how do you represent both interesting and uninteresting, the center and the periphery? Uh, and then uh, the following chapters kind of take the most basic concepts of data science and reinterpret them, re them for humanities. The idea of metadata, the idea of features. Um, and then uh, the last part uh, is focusing on uh, data visualization, right? So up until that point, the book deals with uh, the basic concepts, which in a way you have to know from my point of view, if you want to apply computational methods or to think as data, in relation to any cultural uh, field. And the last chapter deals with visualization, which you can also use in relation to any data, but particularly a focus on the methods we used in our lab, which we call media visualizations, where we kind of display many photographs together, often group them by similarity, by time, and so on. 
Um, and then uh, my favorite chapter, if you want to ask me, is chapter seven, language categories and census, which I also recently published uh, in a very wise form and a short form as a separate article. And uh, this is what I want to spend, you know, just a couple of minutes on, because that's basically was one of my two, I think, main motivations in spending the last 15 years on this project, uh, which of course, you know, I wasn't alone, right? So in parallel, we have strong development of things we call digital humanities. There's now other terms like culturonomics, uh, cultural informatics, computational computing, and since 2013, slow but robust growth of digital art history. So it's a very, very exciting time to be using these tools because you know pretty much any, anything you want to work on, you'll be the first person. Um, so one of my motivation, creating formalization that I can no, I can no longer look at contemporary culture, be it photography, be it, you know, be it digital art, be it film, because there are too many people involved, both uh, professionally and in the amateur way. And uh, I realized this around 2005 and social media was not yet visible, but, it, but I realized it was coming. But the second desire came from my original training as a visual artist and my realization in my teens that the natural language, you know, Finnish, Italian, Russian language, uh, Russian, you know, Mandarin and so on, uh, offers us limited means to talk about nuances and find detail and find differences inside and between images. Um, so I realized that we can adopt data visualization and also the language of mathematics. I mean, not mathematics writing it on paper, but via computation, but computation either way, right? You can realize mathematics. So the languages of numbers and the languages of visualization is the alternative meta languages to uh, make visible and to talk about nuances, right? In images and also as a way to track slow changing uh, slow changes in uh, subjects, you know, compositions, uh, use of light and so on, right? Is a way to kind of compare both two photographs to each other, but also two billion to two billion photographs. And um, I'm not sure, uh, just, just uh, should I finish or I have two more minutes? You can use two more minutes. Yeah, two more minutes, yeah. So I want to show you just a couple of things, right? So I don't need to go to Photoshop. I can just go uh, like few years ago, I can just go to, Right, so this is the most basic thing, right? Uh, what everybody uses, uh, photos, which is, comes for free with your Apple computer, right? And if you look at what we have, right? Uh, the images are described through numbers, right? In visualization, so histogram, which shows you the grayscale, uh, right? The distribution of, of grayscale values in the image, right? Is one, is a one type of visualization. And the rest, you know, we can show us various ways in which we can control photograph, we can change you know, the exposure, right? Uh, you know, uh, reduce shadows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And everything is done through numbers, right? In fact, that's how computer understands. So the computer understands, right? Because the, com the computer image is just a grid of numbers, but also if you're involved in photography, in five years ago, it was more professional since today it's kind of everybody, everybody knows about histograms, right? Uh, including you know, millions of young people who you know may spend we use five, 10, seven applications and hours to edit a single photo for Instagram. Yeah, despite the abundance of photography, uh, people spend even more time than before to make perfect photographs. So I said, if this is the language, uh, the photographic technology, right? The photographic materiality now uses to represent images, which is numbers and visualizations, why not also use it as a language for research, right? And, uh, and then of course, what happened in the next 10 years is this kind of languages the numbers were also adopted uh, by the culture industry and contemporary culture at large. Uh, so not only we look at histograms of individual images and we take photographs, but let's say if I'm going to something like, you know, Google image search, right? And I'm searching for something, right? It analyzes billions of photographs and it may extract things like histograms uh, along with, you know, maybe representations of content. And this what will be used if I, for example, try to find similar images. Right, and so on and so forth. So um, I think I'm going to you know, end here, uh, just maybe just one more practical example. So I'm going to take uh, like some photograph of mine, you know, just something, nothing special. Okay, so something special, right? So here's a photograph I took 2019 when I was traveling for 30 months and living in 27 cities in 18 countries. So it's a kind of photograph I took in Georgia. So I'm just going to right, throw it into the image search and see what Google right is going to uh, is going to give me. Yeah. 
okay, to see you know, how many similar images right, are on the internet. So maybe somebody already took exactly the same image, right? Uh, or maybe not. And the reason I'm showing you is that my kind of the last thing I want to say is that I think the reason um, you know, people who work in visual culture as photographers, designers, uh, educators, and so on should learn something about, uh, right? Should learn something about uh, recapitational materiality of the image, right? Uh, machine learning and so on is that again, these operations now underlie how people interact with this imagery, right? So here I gave Google the image. Uh, it decided that the image of a hill station. In fact, there's no station there. <laughs> it's just hills, right? So it's already not perfect. And then I found those images, which are right more or less similar, but what a similarity, right? Uh, so the goal of my book is to kind of make more people educated about how these things work and then make them question a very simple and perhaps simplistic interfaces we have, right? So not only become culture analysts, but become cultural critics of cultural analytics as it is built in in the software, hardware, and the interfaces of uh, photographic and visual culture around us, right? So why these things are similar? Why Google thinks of this image is more uh, is more similar to this one than this one? Why it's making mistakes? You know how we can create alternative Google, which will give us more controls, right? So uh, in it, so to sum up. In the last 20 years, photography went for a few stages and went from so-called traditional, so to, so to speak, analog stage to uh, digital, even from digital to computational uh, about 10 years ago. And now it's going from computational to the AI stage. Um, and uh, these changes are very fundamental because we change what photograph is, uh, the photographs we take, the photographs we see, uh, if people are going to sell photographs or not. So in my book, I try to both share uh, my experiences of trying to learn and trying to use these computational methods and to think about how these methods can be interfaced, which is a very difficult question to more establish that semi traditional theoretical historiographical issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lev. Um, that was a that was a great um, sort of a dive through these multiple themes. And thanks for showing both of the books. Indeed, I, I I'm very bad in clearly plugging ours. Um, um, I excellent, excellent. Sorry, also, like okay. like um, somebody noted in the chat, um, your background is nicely wanting to be part of the picture. So I I've got a I want to encourage everybody now in the audience to think of questions you want to ask. Uh, Annabelle and, and Lev and, 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 and in relation to these themes and these books. Um, in the meantime, and you can do that via posting it on the, on the Q&A or chat or then just raising your hand um, if you want to speak. And, and again, I'm aware that there's also our contributors in the audience. So I'm, I'm inviting you also to just offer your comments if you want to. Um, in the meantime, while you're thinking about how you might want to, what you want to want to ask, I'll, I'll start with something as a, as a, as a warm up. We have about 35, 40 minutes. So we've got good time for a nice discussion on these themes. Um, even if the um, scales of what we just heard seem to be different, I think there's a lot of connections between the ways in which uh, both of these perspectives to, through different scales and through different kinds of institutional practices also um, um, entangle. And I want to ask something about questions relating to collections and collecting. I'm going to ask this from both of you, but I'll try to frame my question so that it makes sense. So on the one hand, um, much of what you live, uh, you, your project and your talk and your book does is describes a method. I'm trying to be really kind of a clear with this. It describes a method, but mm. it also describes a pipeline of a method or infrastructure yes. of a method. In other right. words, so much is dependent on the fact that you have access to particular kinds of data sets that are usable for this particular mode of analysis. And you outline that well. You outline access to already digitized collections, existing cultural institutions with a certain gravitas. And then you also uh, put it into conversation with platforms such as Instagram as well, as a particular form of collecting, even if it's not collecting at all in the same sense that it used to. And that's already a big difference, but I still want to call it collecting for the sake of the argument. So, and I'll, I'll ask this question to both of you, but for Lev, the question would then be, what? how much emphasis do you think needs to be paid into 
besides developing the methodological things that you just mentioned in relation to visualization and multiple possibilities, would there be a kind of a question also about how do we need to develop particular institutional practices of collecting in the broadest sense that, that go past already existing cultural institutions and go past commercial platforms mm. and give us access to yeah. significant large data sets? And is there, I, that's, that's the sort of a like question I want to ask you. And then Annabelle, the, 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 the other way around as well, right? Because knowing that you have an expertise also besides these questions, also in collections, I didn't mention this, but uh, one of the forthcoming um, work by Annabelle is, is um, um, commissioned history of the British Council's art collection and its relation to global cultural relations. And this is a great example of probably political importance of particular kinds of collecting in terms of that is now highlighted through questions of decolonizing collections and whatnot, right? So I think the question there would be, and in relation to you, Annabelle, is that how would, I would basically invite you as well to talk more about how do you, what is the role of a collection to you as a, as a historian, but also as a scholar? Because the question of the collection is so instrumental to us. And these, these are different ways of understanding what is infrastructure. So uh, who wants to go first? Do, do you want to go first, Lev, because you were talking or Annabelle? Lev? I don't mind. Okay, okay. I'll, be, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but you know I'm lying, right? But I will try. <laughs> well, first of all, this is absolutely a great question. It's a unique question. Nobody asked it before, so that's why I'm so happy to be part of it. We're a number of like masters, you know, of our theoretical craft. It's a great question. And there are so many ways to look at this. Like, for example, if you look at digital humanities, right, which, you know, for better or for worse, has become so popular, it's still mostly text analysis. Why? Because we had things like Project Gutenberg in 1970, and there were, you know, this massive, uh, you know, right, relatively well organized archives, at least in English, and people can now publish articles where we look at hundreds of thousands of volumes, and this allows them to make very interesting arguments. And I think I mentioned in the email to you, right, that even though digital art history started to develop a bit more quicker in the last few years, you know, uh, we feel this completely wide open, so nobody published a single quantitative analysis, whatever it would mean, of some kind of part, right, of photo history. And uh, okay, we have tools, we can do it, the computers are waiting, they're spinning, but what's the data set I will use? I have no idea, right? And as you know yourself, the problem is that uh, the collections, museums, libraries, we take this great whole of human creativity, human culture, and we fragment it, right, into all the silences. You know, now, of course, we have been project like Europeana, for example, I right, try to kind of bring this mosaic back, but uh, you know, it's very partial and institutions are very obsessed about rare collections. I can tell you like a very anecdotal story about uh, how MoMA invited my lab in 2013 and kind of get, get, you know, gave me, you know, gave me access to a collection and maybe terrified that somebody will see it and so on and so forth. Uh, and the thing about Facebook, so it was this kind of golden period between 2007 and 2000. 14 or 15, when uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we basically allowed anybody to download lots of records, right? Lots of posts from our websites. And this generated new fields like computational social science. And then we realized, you know, that oops, maybe people don't want us to, to do it. And uh, Instagram closed this in 2016. That's why I haven't produced any more studies. You know, so we have collection, but, you know, we're perhaps not going to make it available. Uh, I mean, Facebook now has a project where we're making small part of Facebook available to researchers, but you have to apply. And uh, if our institutions, wonderful as we are, use 19th century ideas about what it means to sample photographic culture, you know, I think we do need something else. And at the moment we have some kind of, uh, you probably hate this word, but at the moment we have some kind of nice photo data set, it could actually stimulate lots of interesting research. And we can learn from computer scientists or from AI, which made great progress because everybody works on the same data set. So in fact, uh, you can also imagine a purely theoretical enterprise where we have kind of curated large data set of photography history and we'll have to write about it. You know, and look at this, as opposed to everybody goes to their collection because from scientific point of view, when Annabelle goes to her collection, I go to my collection, nobody can reproduce our research. So uh, here I think we can learn from sciences which you know kind of uh, have interesting solutions in terms of uh, thinking about data, curating data, having to publish your data, uh, and the centrality of data practices, uh, how it emerged in science, and we are so far away from it, right? We're not even on the level of literature, even history of music, we're basically nowhere. 
Um, and that's maybe something to think about. And perhaps in the future, people will be given academic credit, not just for going to some collection elsewhere, but for creating, curating some kind of new digital archive. Exactly. Uh, Annabelle. Um, yeah, it's a great question. It's um, it was some time ago, so I'm just going to kind of backtrack in my mind um, because I think Lev's answer is really, really interesting. Yeah, I've done a lot of work on collections of large scale and quite often they've been um, despised or unwanted collections. I've been really interested in thinking about what's not wanted and what's not kept. Um, and the um, work that I've done for the British Council has been quite different because that has been about um, investing in artists in order to kind of establish a canon and to build reputations and to, um, you know, sort of um, to build a collection that has got some status. It's been quite different to some of my other work, which has been about things that nobody's really paying much attention to. So, for example, I got really interested in um, a, a particular collection of 55,000 photographs all taken on one day in 1987 that, that ended up being the sort of basis for that book, Mass Photography. And they were entrants to a fundraising competition, which was a sort of mass participation event where people were um, asked to send in a photograph on this particular day, accompanied by some money that would go to a charity. Um, and a book was produced at the end of that. But the book only used um, around 300 of the images and 55,000 were submitted. So the vast, vast majority of that collection were the um, you know, unpublished rejects. And that really interested me in that collection because that's precisely the sort of thing that would not normally get kept. And so um, these analog collections of um, what some people call vernacular images are exactly lacking so it's really hard to do that kind of large scale computational analysis on animal collections because they don't exist at the sort of same scale um, my approach is very different however to Lev's in that um, while I think those tools those cultural analytic tools are really really interesting and super appropriate for these massive quantities of billions of images that no person could possibly look at in real time and in many cases aren't even produced by humans too. Um, I've looked at the sort of difference between the mass and the individual and I've used much more ethnographic methods of doing that, of looking very closely at certain singular images or speaking to people about the kinds of motivations behind those images and for me that's one of the sort of interesting methodological contrasts that we've got going here which is that you know in a way we're we're interested in these large bodies of photographs, these large vernacular um, you know, practices and how to make sense of them, but coming at it in completely different ways. And I'm really interested, if I may, in sort of asking a question <laughs> to Lev about this, which is, um, I notice in the book that your cultural analytics book, that you sort of talk about the semantic gap. And that for me is always the challenge, is like, how do you get at the extra pictorial information that lies outside of the frame um you know if you're using computational methods mm -hmm. to read image content and image infrastructure yeah. how do you get at the meaning of what motivated a person yeah. to take that particular image well actually i'm very delighted uh, the way you kind of took this concept you actually did exactly what i did too you actually explained that i borrowed this concept from computer science but it actually has right direct direct relevance to us which is how do you go from what's inside the image to uh, all, the, all the cultural context. And I think, you know, various visual traditions, uh, including visual semiotic, have been also struggling, struggling with it. Uh, and uh, again, the, the full answer will take right hours, but I just want to say that uh, as I was writing a book, right, I became more and more aware about grave challenges of these computational methods. And while I still think that we have to learn them because that's how photography exists today, right? I mean, you open, your camera with a histogram, uh, and uh, we can be very we can be used creatively to look at large image collections. They definitely don't not substitutions for our minds. And uh, here's one example, right? So we can take a photograph or million, billion of photographs, and we can computation analyze it in terms of every possible dimension you can think of, right? The size of faces, face expressions, you know, textures, horizon lines. But how do you know with all these separate attributes? Uh, create an aesthetic and semantic gestalt, 
right? Because that's what we learn from Gestalt Psychology of Dorfenheim, you know, that, that the, the whole is not assembled parts. And this is like a big unanswered question. And I think the only way to answer it is do more experiments. Uh, and for this, we need some kind of photo, photo archives. Um, so as Drusa uh, pointed out, the book lays out a method and a kind of workflow. And me and my students were able to produce many interesting examples. And then we eventually run into like really hard problems. And that's why in my newest project, which I will not mention, I'm actually not even using images, I'm actually doing text analysis because in text it's much easier to get with semantics. Uh, so what I learned in 16 years of cultural analytics, what makes a good photograph is mysterious. We probably will never know. And that's why we all study art and love art because we can understand this. And the computers can help us to look at this, but perhaps we'll never understand why we react to this photograph as opposed to that photograph. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's. I, be, I became like a superhumanist as a result of this, of this kind of immersion. <laughs> yes, um, but I, I, I but I like the tension. I mean, and it's a very productive tension in terms of looking at scales of collections at scholarship. And I've got I've got ideas of a question that, I mean, I'm interested in everything that goes between um, the one and the many, uh, or the whole and the composite, but I'm not going to ask that because we got great questions in the chat, and I want to first especially start with Joanna Zelinska's question because Joanna is also a contributor to the book, um, 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 and, and whose who's chapter on AI and 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 undigital and and and, and such are, is a wonderful entry. But I'm going to read out what Joanna is asking um, you to. Um, it's a diagnostic and propositional query for both of you, Annabelle and Lev. What is it for you, the th key thing we oh, sure. firstly do, and what should do with photographs today, apart from uh, looking at uh, looking at them? So I guess there's also exactly the sort of a, like, what is it apart from looking at them that we do and should do as well? That's quite a, that's quite a question, but it's a quite an amazing question. Um, which mm -hmm. one of you wants to go first? Oh, Annabelle, of I'm course, I need gonna to think go. about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I need to think about this for a uh, week. So I'm just going to go with a mass immediate response. Because yeah. how can you possibly answer such an amazing question? <laughs> I'd love to have the answer. I'm sort of going to answer in response to something that I'm thinking about at present, if I may, yeah. which is um, some of these COVID um, crowdsourced photographic collections. So um, mm. I'm looking at the moment at some collections that have emerged from um, public projects that asked um, the public to take a photograph of their experience of COVID, picturing lockdown is one in England, one by Historic England, there was another one done by the National mm. Portrait Gallery, and um, I've been looking at those images and I've been thinking about some of these frameworks for how you work with, you know, 30,000 images all on the same subject. And, um, you know, because in a way they reproduce in microcosm some of those aspects of sameness and repetition and cultural practice and norms that we're interested in, in thinking about large scale um, photographic practice. But I'm just finding that thinking about what's in those images is just not helping. <laughs> Even though I'm, you know, a visual studies person, I ought to be looking at what's in the images. I keep feeling frustration that, you know, being able to see lots of pictures of people making sourdough loaves, for example, or taking photographs of rainbows in the windows of their houses, or families trapped behind the glass of their front door, or their windows, mm. these tropes that are sort of emerging as the kind of visual culture of um, certain experiences of lockdown, just not getting me anywhere. What can I do by saying that, you know, there's X amount of photos of NHS workers of X amount of photographs of rainbows and for me it's about everything that lies outside of the frame so it's that extra pictorial semantic um, effective quality that is helping me understand those photographs so in a way it doesn't really matter what they look like it's about why people wanted to collect them in the first place why people established the projects why people thought it was meaningful to take part and what people hoped their image would communicate so all of those things are outside of the frame. They're there in the text, they're there in the project brief, they're there in the discussion around the photographs and the photographs could almost be blank. So it's a really strange kind of counterintuitive response to your question, which is, yes. you know, maybe we shouldn't actually look at the images. 
I'm throwing it out as a contrary yeah. after. Well, to thank you for thank you for taking it. You know, uh, thank you for being first. So I thought of an answer, and uh, so delighted. But uh, John is also here. I've been recommending her book, and uh, you know, uh, I think photography is the most interesting new media these days. And also photographic scholarship is very interesting these days. And I think this panel and uh, you know, what other people are saying is a great example. So, uh, so two answers very quick. So one of the reasons I also got very attracted to photography, you know, a few years ago, I came back to photography. I mean, one of my first articles was, what is digital photography in 1994? Is that we realized that uh, photography is one of a few practices today where tiny visual differences and tiny visual distinctions matter a lot. So I've been spending you know, thousands of hours, right? Watching literally hundreds of photo tutorials, you know, how a person shows you how he or she edits the portrait, right? In Lightroom, I'm not even talking about, you know, like professional photography. I'm not even talking about a relative of mine who says, okay, I'm, a port I'm basically like photographing landscape using four by five and I'm going to go and stay for eight hours and wait for the light, just be in the right place, right? And this amazing, amazing uh, sensitivity, right? And intelligence around the single image, you know, we live in this kind of culture where things are accelerated, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, people spend, uh, right today, if you actually want to look at fine works of art, you look at advertising, not at art installations because they're designed to be consumed like in one second, right? So photography, in fact, is something from a different era where uh, people spend you know, hours and days working on a single image and um, and also talking about it, right? Uh, where we use histograms in, in numbers or where we use a different language. But uh, I'm totally fascinated by this. And um, it speaks to my, um, to let's say, I think what happened to visual arts, right? One of the places where visual art is today is not the art, which the art is doing something else. It's wonderful, but it's not art. But what happened to visual art Right, the creation of meanings and effects through light is in photography today. The second thing is we should enjoy looking at photographs because we may not have that much left. And I'm not talking about global warming, not at all. I'm talking about the fact that uh, as photography went through these stages very quickly in the last 15 years, digital, computational, and now AI, uh, if you go and try you know, the Luminar AI, right, which is the latest kind of photo editing software, the kind of effects and enhancements you can do to photograph a single button, uh, I never want to take another picture again because what's the point, right? Uh, I can make, a, I can take anything, I can just take picture, right, randomly and make it perfect. And I kind of feel that uh, the human civilization, now well, this is going to kill me, I think maybe we're reaching the end of what we can get out from a single respectable image. In terms of its aesthetic powers, right? Its emotional powers, its ideological powers. And now with AI, right? I mean, things only started a few years ago. So, um, and, and for photography in a way is a bit in the foreground of how AI being integrated into, into kind of contemporary culture. Uh, you know, you'll be, anybody will be able to make the perfect image or a perfectly imperfect image within the last next 10 years. And then, you know, how do professionals can even compete with amateurs? So I feel that in the next few decades, the new uh, realm of human creativity will actually go to 3D, but not to the idiotic VR, AR, which will all die away pretty quickly, but some kind of 3D holographic, three dimensional things uh, where the still images will exist perhaps in 30 years, but may become less important simply because it will be challenging again to get amazing aesthetic, ideological, semantic effects out of this kind of holographic, three dimensional things. Whereas we're going to squeeze every possible thing we can do out of a still image now with AI scientists got into a picture. So I think we should enjoy looking because maybe, you know, this uh, photo culture is not going to last forever. Yeah, 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 I understand. I mean, speculating, um, of course, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And we might want to pick up on that as well. Um, there was a question um, from Evin Rosak from Oslo to Lev, but I think you, Lev, might have already I answered, responded yeah, I answered, yeah, in the already chat. I try, I try to, like, real exactly. time. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So those questions about the relations of cultural analytics and digital humanities and such being answered, so we might not to, it's, those are core questions, but I want, I might want, this is not a question, but it's it's from Anna Peraika, and it's not a question, but perhaps it can for, be formulated into a question. And I'll read the comment aloud, because it's quite, if you don't mind, Anna, 
um, because it's quite apt in terms of, uh, I'll use it as a bridge as well. So Anna wrote to us that having a small photo studio opened in 34, I'm always amazed with the idea of people, their portraits are being kept in the archive. Each person produces at least seven ID cards, eight passports during a lifetime with a number of visas. I can, I can easily imagine that fictional archive of drilled images be used as training sets. And of course, this sort of a like, what I'm reading here as well is, is the interesting question that we partly already discussed as well is that all those images that are not art images, all those images that are not culture in the sense of uh, culture yeah. of, of, you know, creative culture, but the sort of a like all the things that form the backbone, of course, we've known this from photography scholarship, from Farocchi to Sekula to many, many others as well. This sort of a like whether they are called even instrumental images, but the images that are administrative, like a, you know, mugshot and such. I wonder what they are indeed, and I'm trying to formulate this into a question, but it's sort of a, when reading for instance, your, lab, your book as well, is that what would be the possibilities of shifting the ways in which you talk about cultural analytics to uh, the things that also humanities have been moving on from discussing culture as in creative culture to culture as in relating to whether it's, it's this sort of a gray zones of how power works, whether it's in terms of these administrative forms of images and the data sets included there, for instance, I mean, it's it's not a, I mean, passport images, ID cards, but also other sorts of images. And I'm interested in the question of, for instance, images that are um, the big, you know, the big images of um, climate sciences, for instance, the ways in which we sure. can move and this relates to the broader aspect of, for instance, environmental humanities in terms of what kind of an image are we looking at so that we don't narrow ourselves only to culture in the particular sense, right? Um, if you have any thoughts on that, Lev, in terms of what you feel interesting, and then we can also see of how this might, if you want to jump in in any way, Annabelle, as well, in terms of this question of what is it that we're looking at, what's sort of a, uh, I don't know, I don't want to call it genre, but well, in, in particular. No, I mean, to be so honest, between, 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 between the references, you know, which you name, like Fran Farouk and also Joanne in the audience, like, you know, I'm not sure what else I can add, but it's absolutely true, you know, and everybody, you know, I recommend that everybody, you know, reads your book and everybody reads her book about like, non-human photography, but this operational uh, images, so interface images, you know, all the different things, some will start discussing in the 90s, they're very, very important. But here's what's interesting, right? Uh, you can also say something, you know, which wouldn't be very smart. You can follow Friedrich Hitler who famously said like in the eighties today, right? Most texts are written and read by computers, right? Uh, all these files and today you can see most images are written and read, definitely read, right? Uh, you know, by, by, you know, by, uh, you know, by, 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 um, you know, by, uh, by computer vision algorithms, by neural networks, you know, like people have a strange idea with maybe evil people inside Instagram looking to images. Oh my God, you know, we're barely able to keep Instagram going. You know, believe me, it's the last thing we're going to do. Uh, you know, we, 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 you wish, right? You wish. Um, but, uh, but here's what's interesting, you know, that um, I myself was very excited about it uh, in my dissertation, PhD dissertation 30 years ago, I was writing about radar and I'm still excited about it, but I'm somehow came back to be excited about mm. if a culture in photo photography in a single photograph. In fact, I'm developing I'm developing few small book projects. One of them, it's a whole book where I'm analyzing a single photograph. <laughs> so I managed to come back from these billions of images and cultural analytics back to a single photograph. So I'm not quite sure what's going to come out. And also what's interesting from a point of view of pure data production, right? You think, okay, with all the sensors and cars and you know, God knows where, and obviously we might be producing Right, uh, sort of right, zillions of data and what the humans can do. Well, actually, it turns out that just purely from data science, from like what data being produced in the world, but whatever it means, right? Perhaps a bit of an idiotic question. The humans produce more than everybody else because because of social media photography, right? So, in fact, you know, in a way, what will be like when probably people look back at our era, hypothetically, some aliens come, you know, we'll have this, right, uh, sort of fields of networks storing with Instagram images because it will just it will just dwell over everything else. Um, and to the extent that I think today, right, photography in a way has become the central cultural forum, the way maybe music was 20 years ago and everybody was doing something with guitar, right? I mean, uh, like I walk around, right? I walk around Seoul or, you know, I walk around Korea, what do people do, right? 
everybody reads on their phone or takes pictures, right? Mm. Everybody became photographer. And that's why like, I'm very interested to come back and actually talk about photography as opposed to wonderful things like satellites, radar, visualization, because in a way it sort of, mm. it sort of became, I mean, it was always central, but became more central than ever. And that's a very interesting moment. So uh, mm. I love a John that talks about non-human photography, but I actually want to go back to human photography because it's actually, it's young again, right? Photography is the newest new media because of computation, because of scale, because of interest in analog, because of all these wonderful things, right? Because of mm -hmm. you guys, because of sculpture. Photography is very sexy again. <laughs> so I'm actually for photography. Yeah, no, no, that, that I understand. Do you want to pick up on this, Annabella, or engage with the question that we got in the chat? Which one do you want to do? Um, I just wanted to quickly say yeah. something about what Lev said. It isn't actually a response to the question, but I was so interested what you said, Lev, about, you know, time might be running out. We better sort of look at photography because it might not have long left. I think that was what you were saying when you were saying, you know, <laughs> photography is kind of at risk. I scared, I scared I think... myself, but it's like, you know, just... Yes. Everybody should yeah, go look now, think because 20 years. That's <laughs> one of the... It's one of the key premises of photography off the scale, I think, is that the anxieties about scale are people thinking that, you know, can we even talk about photography anymore? Has it morphed out of shape by becoming, um, you know, informational, computational, AI and so on, that timeline that you tracked? But it's also this anxiety that there's too many photos and that it's not doing us any good. And I think it's, you know, there's people here who have written about this too. And in the book, um, I really liked what um, Jeff Batchen said, where he said the death of photography has been declared so many times that I regard such declarations as signs of life. Um, and yeah, Joanna and Michelle have talked about this in their work as well. So I'm really interested to hear you sort of, um, you know, also share that sense of threat, because maybe it's what's animating some of this new thinking. Um, I didn't have a response to the question about the sort of passport photo and the informational data in the archive, mm. so happy to. Oh, I'm I'm I just wanted to make that comment. That's okay. Shall I? Shall we go to Michelle's question? Uh, yeah, so basically, um, as you were saying, and I, I, my internet dropped for a couple of seconds, you might have already said, I mean, there's um, um, Michelle Henning's wonderful chapter in the book as well, um, 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 deals with these questions of, of how to problematize the discourse of abundance and such, but also um, Michelle's question builds on what uh, Annabelle said, and I'll just read it aloud, builds on what Annabelle said about photos um, being able to be almost uh, blank, um, I'm not 100% I'm reading it. I'm not 100% convinced by the distinction between what is in the photo and what is extra photographic if a photo is part of a conversation or a phallic gesture, as I think it is in social media, isn't the banal repetitiveness part of the conversation often. So, so low, so, so do, low yeah. um, um, and so forth. So even if the specificity of the slope is an important element, the banality um, is. So what do you think? about the idea that photography has become conversational, which is great in a conversation to engage with. Yeah. Michelle, that's such a great question. Um, if I can direct it back to you in part, I really loved your chapter in the book where you talk about the critique of photography as a universal language and you shift it to the sort of fears about photographic chatter i.e. too many images that, are, that seem sort of inconsequential. And I love the way that you link that to a sort of gendered and misogynist frame of reference for thinking about, um, you know, photographs as being sort of perceived as banal, so vernacular photographs yeah. and photographs circulating on um, a sort of feminized form of social media communication. I thought that was really interesting. And I think there is definitely a lot more that to say that, um, that's complex and interesting about photography and language than my quick and dirty response <laughs> covered. Um, I think, yeah, what you say is absolutely correct. That if it's part of a conversation, then it's it, it is it isn't it isn't right to say it could be blank because it's using um, a pictorial means to engage in the communication, just as you said about emojis in your in your chapter. So it isn't um, it isn't quite true to say that they could be blank and empty. But I'm interested in your use of the of the word banal, because to me, I think, um, you know, if we're talking about human made photographs, say, circulating on social media, they are only banal to other people who don't, who aren't connected with them. There's only ever other people's photographs that are banal, I think. 
and people talk about banality in relation to large volumes of photographs because they're looking from such a distance that all of the individual motivations and purposes and communicative structures around that photograph have become invisible and so you just see lots and lots of photographs of the same thing but individually each of those photographs is not banal I think they're individually meaningful and purposeful and you know serving kind of yeah. communicative functions that kind of get blurred out when you start to look at masses I don't yeah, think I've quite answered your question but I've riffed on some of your ideas perhaps sounds great can yeah. I also try to yeah can I also try to answer yeah. add something thank you yeah to Annabella um so a few things so one thing is um yeah I think it's a great idea uh, that uh, one of the new changes and functions of photography of some photography is that it becomes kind of conversational uh, and it makes sense right uh, of course this idea that in communication right, the communicational content it's only one of many functions of communication I mean it goes back to at least people like Roman Jakobson right his famous 1960 article right you have communication where you check with channels or you have communication where you kind of establish some empathy right with the sender uh, and before I mean, we couldn't do it for photographs because it was so expensive, right? Time-wise and, and the produce photographs. So now photographs became so easy to produce. We can use them, right? As a kind of ping, right? But uh, what I want to say is I think, uh, and I'm not saying anybody present among audience uh, or uh, participants say it, but I think you know, I want to speak against something which is a danger. The danger to equate scale with banality and abandons, right, with uh, non-originality. It is true that through uh, computational recommendation systems, through, you know, the, since, you know, for the automation, which already was built in photography for decades, where you can take pictures, you know, in a particular kind of, right, particular subject, and it will just exposure, which goes back to 1980. Through all the different mechanisms, there were lots of photographs, which are not very original, but, as Annabelle says, uh, they are very important, very meaningful to people who take them and to their families, right? Uh, but there's also lots of photographs which are regional. And that's what I realized, you know, when we look at 17 million Instagram images, you can find everything there, right? I mean, you can find all kinds of photographic communities, you people get together uh, because we share certain aesthetics and when we go photograph things together, you find everything's there. But I also want to say something else. What has become kind of banal uh, unfortunately, and or let me put it this way, as technology advances, certain cultural practices humans had, one by one, but maybe not all, are going to become completely meaningless. And photography, I think, it happens first. What I mean is like this. So think about the whole photographic culture, 19th, 20th century, with photographers and photo clubs and people learning over skill zone system. Now you can just take this, and without even looking, you can take a photograph, which is as good as 99% of those photographs professionals took in the 19th century. Right? All the skills got completely put inside the software and hardware. And I go to this endless, right, like photo exhibitions, and you see these huge photographs blown up, right, with color photographs. And, you know, in Soho, you can, I mean, in uh, Chelsea, you can go to New York, and we charge you 30,000 for these photographs. I'm like, why? Right? Anybody can take this. Now, that's not to say that uh, particular photographers, I mean, maybe it is Cartier-Bresson or whoever, but you can automate it. I think not, but most of what it is. And it may happen in the future with music, with film, with you know, other things. Um, so, um, and this is, so what happened is not that, that there are billions of people who take banal photographs. What happens is there are billions of people who take absolutely professional photographs, like only professionals could 20 years ago, and what it means, that's what we have to think about, you know, that this, right, this, this kind of crafts, this whole photo culture, taking a photograph, it sort of became, yeah, it's, it's, literally, it's literally just you know, one button press and they're good photographs. Yeah. And this is kind of, this is a big, to me, that's a huge change, you know, it's a yeah. huge change. And I'm afraid it will happen to our arts as years goes by, you know. Yeah. So how do I look at this photographs of the 20th century was supposed to be great. I'm like, no, it's not so great. It's just, I can just do, everybody can do it like this now, you know? Mm. Not all of them, but many of them. Yeah, um, the alien civilization that comes at some point and, and, and the data sets of a certain years are basically loaves of bread 
and try to do an affect and analysis based on the flows of phrase of what the hell was going on with human civilization. But I guess part of this is in, in, indeed is, is the ways in which meta pictures builds a sense of affect that is, is beyond and the sort of affective community. So there's, there's a kind of tweak of affect theory and Benedict Anderson is probably in the logs of bread as well. But we have a question and I want to get to it because we are running out of time, but I want to give space to one more question, if that's okay. And I'll read it aloud as, as, as before as well, is Mace Oyala. Um, one thing what would be nice to hear about, perhaps at the mo at most educated in intuitions, uh, what panelists imagine the people doing this kind of cultural analysis or otherwise thinking about photographs and visuals inside the corporations and at Instagram, at Siemens, Google, think about photography and images the other way around? Are they colleagues to academics? Or how does it look from the point of view, no, the, the other way around as well? If you can you know, have brief comments, because we might still be able to squeeze in one more question after this as well. So um, any any brief comments of how this, if you... Yeah, I can, I can, so I can be very brief, yeah. Uh, And this is only based on my intuitions, but also my personal experiences. So how many conversations I had about obviously aesthetic issues, political issues, people in these companies? Zero. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, what we do, right? We're basically trying to serve the clients, whether the clients are professional photographers or billions of normal people. We engage, right? You know, top photographers, good photographers, you know, uh, right, who represent them, right? Like with, you know, Canon photo exhibition and Fuji photographer, you know, now we engage with people and actually put their knowledge into neural networks, right? It's all happening. But I think uh, what's going on inside these companies is we actually, we believe in this very standard, right? Four by five romantic idea of artists, artists are creators, who are creators. So I think theoretically it's not, right? We haven't gone for kind of critical theory, postmodern change. We believe it. Like, like everybody believes in this world who, who is not us, right? We all believe in this 19th century <laughs> idea, right? You know, uh, like all the CI people who make this AI art, we say, well, this is art because it looks like Monet, right? <laughs> Again, I may be wrong, right? Because I, I, I kind of encountered these people, uh, but I never was able to have conversation, but I also wonder, right? Why we don't come and have conversations with us? Uh, partly I think because you know, we're busy doing technology, but partly we kind of do believe in this, um, I think like, like mainstream society does, in this kind of romantic idea of, you know, artist, creator, kind of genius, mm -hmm. and we're here to serve them. Mm -hmm. uh, and at least, I mean, I read like industry blogs, I go to industry conferences, right? And I'm trying to find like, right? I'm trying to see if I can find some like, like atoms of something else. And at least I haven't seen anything else, which is very disappointing because these are people who should be theorizing what we're creating, right? But I don't think we are. Mm, yeah, but that's, my, that's my experience. You know, that's my, which is very disappointing. Is there something there that I you want to pick up on? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, just one sentence, maybe, to say that I think Nathan Jurgensen, who is the sort of sociologist in residence at Snap or Snapchat, um, oh. is doing some really interesting work. Um, in his book, The Social Photo, you know, it's, it's sort of a, it's a popular work for a public audience, but I think he is actually right. doing something really interesting. And the fact that Snap um, employ a sociologist, I think is in itself really interesting. So I think there is some work going on um, that is worthy yeah. of reading from inside the industry. Good point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I thought that would be perhaps a final question is more of a comment, but I'll still read it aloud about, um, this comes from uh, uh, Varam, um, about this, that common ground for discussion is on what is photography is an archaic consensus of early analog and perhaps photography is to be treated more in terms of information and data that is not only for human perception. But I think that what we actually try to say in multiple ways is exactly that it is. It's already in those analog collections, information and data based on metadata and whatnot that you showed quite literally in the pictures, Annabelle, because that's data and metadata. And, and Lev's work is premised on the idea that um, it's not only humans looking at pictures. Um, so I guess that we already, and our book photography of the scale as well is trying to answer is that what is it that is invisible to human perception that we still try to decipher with multiple different theoretical and analytical tools um, so there's a lot there that we sort of try to i guess build a sense of as well beyond the digital and beyond the Trevor Packland discourse of invisible pictures which is great but it's not the whole story about uh, invisibility of the mass image right 
Um, any mm. final thoughts, uh, Annabelle and Lev, before we uh, conclude? Anything you want to add, address? Yes, Annabelle, Lev. first. Just to say thanks. Please. That's all. Please. Just Annabelle. saying thank you, and yeah, um, yeah oh, I have nothing clever to say except for saying I've really enjoyed the discussion and the questions. Thank you. Massively. Well, I want to thank you, participants, and I want to a wonderful audience. It's really not so right? not so not so often that we have a more specialized discussions on one topic. And I want to say, you know, this is how I would sum it up, but that's my version. There is no such thing as photography, where it never was, there's only photographers. Photography is part of conversation, photography is data, photography is image, and there are hundred different things. Just as there is no internet, there is no uh, there is no you know America, there is no Instagrams. And what's great about computational tools, if you want to find out what billion people do on Instagram, hypothetically you can. So you no longer have to produce a general statement, Instagram this, Instagram that, right? Uh, and people, if people tell you that, don't listen to them because we don't know what we're talking about. And I think this multiplicity always existed, but at least now the computational tools give us at least illusion that you can actually find out what's going on. And what we're going to find out, I think is multiplicity, but you know, we kind of always knew it. And uh, I think uh, that knowing, having the sophisticated understanding of history photographies, I think people today are trying to perhaps simplify too often digital mm -hmm. photography, network photography, Instagram photography. Where is that? Where are as many photographers people doing it? So there's probably one billion photographer, photographers out there. And uh, this is kind of my final message is that uh, think variability, think diversity as opposed to one thing. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great way of finishing, and I think we all you know agree on the multiplicity here as well. And and I said, you know, between the the, the one and the many, there's 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 multiple dimensions uh, for us to engage with. Um, thank you very much, Annabelle and Lev, and uh, thank you, Michal, for setting this up. And and I encourage everybody to dig into the books. And I want to also thank the audience for wonderful questions, wonderful comments, and just being being there, and paying attention. So thank you so much. And I'll see you everybody soon. Goodbye. Take, take good pictures and take good pictures. Take good pictures, take bad pictures. No, take good pictures. Bye-bye. <laughs>